In this video, I'd like to talk about the uh, notion of communication climate and what that is and what we can do to improve communication climates. So let's start with, first of all, what do we mean when we say communication climate? When we think about climate, most of the time people think about things like, you know, desert climates or tropical climates or frozen climates, right? Weather type of climates, which have their own unique characteristics and differences about them. And, and that's very true. Some of them more appealing to others, uh, to some people than others, and and uh, we all have different preferences there, right? So, but we're not talking about weather climates here when we talk about communication climates. What we're really talking about is, you know, how do you feel when you go? There are some classes that you probably just, when you go to these classes, you just dread it, right? You're just not interested. You, you, the instructor's not very interesting, or or for whatever reason, the topic doesn't appeal to you. Some of them we just dread, whereas other classes we really enjoy attending and participating in those classes. They're, they're more up our alley, or, or for whatever reason, we just enjoy those classes more. Uh, the climate in one class is very different than the other. We have the same thing in uh, professional-type environments and personal-type environments, where some situations, some occasions, we're just not really excited about it, not very interested, uh, and it just doesn't appeal to us. Uh, whereas others, you know, we're really excited about that and, and have this warmer climate that we really enjoy and look forward to. So that's kind of where we're headed with this idea of communication climate. So a communication climate, first of all, is what we would broadly describe as the social tone of the relationship. Is this a relationship that we really enjoy and look forward to seeing this person and, and enjoy engaging with them and have an appreciation for them? Or is it somebody who we have to really kind of work ourselves, you know, steal ourselves to deal with this person? You know, we're, we're just kind of like have to be around this person so i have to make it work and i'm not really looking forward to it so what kind of uh, social tone do we have in this relationship and that's what we mean by communication climate and it's generally felt by everyone in the relationship it's not just you everybody can kind of sense the aura the climate around this the situation and and it can be uh, a little awkward or it can be really wonderful depending on how people feel about that so it's generally felt by everyone in the relationship it does change over time. It can change over time in either direction. It could be somebody that initially you're like, I really don't care for this person. I don't really want to be around them. I dread kind of going around this person. And eventually you warm up to them and create this kind of bond. And it may be somebody that you truly enjoy then eventually um, being around and getting to know and things. But And it could go the other way. It could be somebody that initially, initially you really like them. And then that relationship kind of cools over time. And, and uh, so these types of things can change. Just like, the, you know, again, not to overdo this... Uh, this kind of uh, connection, but the, the this kind of like the weather changes from season to season, right? This this communication climate can change over time as a part of this relationship. It's really challenging to forecast. We really don't always know exactly how something's going to go. Again, we could anticipate that we're going to like this person and, and then that changes, or we could vice versa, anticipate that we're not going to be interested and in that changes. But it's kind of challenging to forecast how the climate's going to work out for, for these situations. It is able to be changed and impacted by people, though. I mean, we are the primary force that determines what kind of communication climate there's going to be. This is not, you know, a predestined type of thing. We can really change and impact the climate in little ways or in big ways. So, And so can other people. It's, it's certainly able to be changed by us and by other people in the relationship as well. So the communication climate, again, just kind of the social tone of that relationship. Is it is it warm and friendly? Is it, like, you know, natural and... and something you enjoy or is it kind of frigid and uh, and and, uh, and cool and distanced right and aloof that you're not you know or is it just outright you know negative is it aggressively negative is it is it really you know um, conflicted and you know a lot of conflict and things like that so um, that's what we mean by communication climate though what's the general kind of sense of what the social tone of that relationship is so these climates uh, develop in a variety of ways. So uh, they develop, though, largely through our communication with the other person. So if we imagine, really, the communication climate has to do with how we value that person and how we express how much we value or, or what we value about them. So if we think about this in the sense of this this kind of continuum that we have here on the right-hand side, you know, on, on the right-hand side, there's going to be, uh, you know, high uh, value on the, uh, the, the or sorry, high value over here and then lower value on on the, the left hand side of your screen there so um on on the high degree value we have what we call confirming communication 
confirming communication. So these are messages that confirm that person's value to us and confirm that we value that person in general, right? So messages like, I like you, you're neat, you matter, those are types of confirming communication that, that indicate that we value that person. Then we, on the opposite side of that, we have disconfirming communication, which are messages that essentially convey that we don't value that person, that we don't value their contribution or, or, or you know, whatever about them. So uh, there we have messages that come up like, you're worthless, you disgust me, get away from me. Those would be disconfirming messages that send a clear message of, you are not someone I value, uh, so um, you're on the other end of that spectrum then, okay? So, with that in mind, we can look at the different levels of communication. Now, again, this is a, continua a continuum here. It's not, a, it's not an either-or type situation. You can see that that's an error. So, let's bring back that continuum, this degree of value uh, that we have for people. Again, on one end, we have a really high degree of value and low degree of value on the other, but there's everything in the middle there as well. So, we already established that confirming messages uh, convey a sense of value about the other person. So, confirming messages include things like recognition, acknowledgement and endorsement those would be different levels recognition just just really confirming that you see that person that you understand that they are there at a basic level you're not ignoring them you're not you know pretending that they're invisible or whatever uh, you're recognizing that they are there they are an entity and, the, and that even a, at the lowest level is a sense of value it provides a sense of value then acknowledgement would be things like i understand you i understand where you're coming from i can see your perspective uh, that would be acknowledgement and that's a little higher level of confirming message and and then finally endorsement would be i agree with you I, I you know i support you i agree with you and that really conveys a great deal of value for that person right so uh, but all of them confirming messages all of them messages that convey value or convey a sense of value that we value that person so that would be on the high end of the degree of value uh, now again it's not either it's not either or you know, we can be in the middle. So there are some messages that we call disagreeing messages that really kind of fall in the middle. So you have messages of argument, argumentativeness and complaining, which both sound kind of negative, right? But truthfully, they're kind of in the middle. It really depends on how you frame them and how you approach them. It's possible to have a friendly disagreement with somebody to friend, you know, kind of some, some relationships are, are kind of based on that argumentativeness. Um, but but we don't argue in, in, in a, you know, disagreeing message could go either way. When we're arguing with somebody and we start getting really aggressive and uh, and starting, you know, calling them names or, or calling them dumb or, or really coming down on their ideas really harshly, that would lean toward the more, you know, disconfirming side of things with a lower degree of value. But it's possible to argue with somebody and and still support them, still still convey value to them in the way that we argue with them. And the same thing about complaining. When we complain about um, in a descriptive way, so we, we complain about, you know, I don't, you know, we seem to be leaving a lot of dishes around here that are unwashed, you know, I wish, you know, kind of wish people would put their dishes away. That That is laying out the issue, uh, but not pointing the finger, right? As opposed to a value of, you never do this. Why can't you ever clean your dishes? That would lean toward the, the more disconfirming side of things, right? So disagreeing messages could go either way. That's the point. The argumentativeness and complaining could go either way. So they're right in the middle of that degree of value. But then on the, on the other end of things, the, the lower degree of value, kind of on the lower end of things, you have uh, the truly disconfirming messages. Messages like aggressiveness and ostracism, right? Aggressiveness meaning things like, uh, you know, the, the most contemporary example of this would be bullying. When we, when we verbally assault somebody, when we verbally tear somebody down, when we when we treat them in that way, and it doesn't have to be verbally, it could be non-verbally too, when, we, when we're aggressive with somebody, when we are, are very specific about our intent to to put them down and keep them down at a lower level, right? That's a disconfirming message. It conveys a very very much a lack of value for that person. And then ostracism, when we just totally exclude, I mean, the, one example is when you're in elementary school, maybe you had a, you ever play a game when you, when you just kind of got a group together and and all agreed to just ignore this other person like they didn't exist, just don't even acknowledge that they're existing, or, or push them out of this particular group in some way, um, that's ostracism, and it conveys, obviously, a real lack of value for that person and, and a very disconfirming message. So, so again, we have these messages that exist at different levels, right? All of this, the, the disconfirming messages in different ways can lead to defensiveness, right? And so what we mean by defensiveness is if we if we think back to an earlier lesson here, we we had uh, we talked about the presenting self, 
that we all have this this piece of our you know we're trying to present this image we're putting this together and what, what we do when we do that is called face right we're, we're we're building face we're creating this this kind of image of who we want to be and how we want to be seen but when somebody contradicts that with a disconfirming message when somebody comes out and, and contradicts that that's what we call a face threatening act they are they are coming at us with the intention of kind of destroying or contradicting um, what we're trying to sell, so to speak, with our face. Not, not, not our physical face, but the, the, the image that we're presenting. And when we are faced with a face-threatening act, when we're, we're confronted with a face-threatening act, we tend to get defensive. Okay, so that leads to defensiveness. So, uh, so we need to be aware of that, and we'll kind of circle back around to this here in just a second. But, uh, but we need to be aware of that, uh, that the face-threatening acts, and that's really the, the root of much of the defensiveness that we see in people. So what can we do to create supportive climates then? Well, again, let's bring back our, our continuum here and talk about things in the sense of confirming and disconfirming messages. There are different types of messages. For example, evaluative versus descriptive messages, evaluation versus description. People don't like to be evaluated necessarily. That can create that defensiveness when we're saying, you've done this wrong, or you're doing this wrong, as opposed to, this is what's happening. Let's look at, let's be descriptive and describe what's happening without pointing finger. So, uh, again, evaluation can lead to defensiveness. Description leads to a more supportive uh, communication climate. Then, right? Control versus problem orientation. When somebody is, uh, you know, when we focus on the problem itself as opposed to trying to control that other person and, uh, and kind of put them under our uh, management or whatever. People don't like that. People don't like to be controlled. I'm sure you don't like to be controlled any more than necessary. So we could focus on the problem instead of trying to control that person. Strategy versus spontaneity. People don't like to feel like they're being um, corralled into something or, or, or you know, I've been surprised. For example, if I, if I came to you and I said, hey, what are you doing on Friday night? And you said, well, and you're thinking, you know, well, I'm inviting you to go do something fun on Friday night. And I said, oh, great. So you're available to come help me move then, right? You don't have anything going on, so there's no reason you can't help me come move. Well, now it seems like I pulled one over on you. Right, that I had this strategy in mind, that I manipulated things to really uh, take advantage of you. So uh, people don't like that. They like spontaneity. They like to be able to to make their own decisions, of course. And so instead of you know pulling that whole thing, I could have just said, "Hey, I'm moving Friday night. Is there any chance you're available to help me?" That gives you the option to say yes, no, whatever, to be spontaneous in in your uh, in your response. Neutrality versus empathy. Neutrality sounds good, like it wouldn't be a bad thing, right? But neutrality is very cold in some sense. So if you're, if somebody's talking to you about an issue and you're, you're playing devil's advocate or you're taking both sides or whatever, that neutrality can be seen as not valuing that person because you're not supporting them. So we need to try and uh, express some empathy. That doesn't mean you have to agree with them and totally just tell them, yeah, go do that. But uh, you don't have to throw fuel in the fire, but we can express some empathy um, while at the same time talking to them about different things. Superiority versus uh, equality. Nobody likes to be made to feel like they're less than. Um, they want to feel like they're e we are equal to them and they are equal to us. So we need to be clear about that. And certainty versus provisionalism. What we mean here is you you don't necessarily have all the answers. Okay, you may have some facts, and that's great. Facts are facts, uh, but sometimes facts are proven wrong themselves, right? But so we need to be cautious about saying this is what's true. And this is how I see it. We need to qualify things sometimes with, you know, in my opinion, or I believe this, you know, or I think that this is the proper way to go uh, and, and provide some wiggle room there, not just for ourselves, not to be squirmy ourselves, but to provide some room for that other person to have their own ideas and, and their own thoughts. So we want to express our, ourselves through invitational communication. And uh, there are a couple of things we mean by that. First of all, we want to use the language of choice. Language of choice, as though we have something to choose, and so does the other person. You know, people get drawn into, you know, this this language of I have to. We don't we don't want to use that language of I have to do this. I mean, there are some things you have to do, right? But there are some things that we need to choose to do to better our situation too. It's not that, you know, I have to go. Uh, do what I want to do, or do something I don't want to do. We want to rephrase that and say, because I'm in this situation, I need to need to get this accomplished and, and stop using this, like we don't have any choice there. And the same way we want to do that with other people. We don't want to say, you should do this, or you have to do this, or we can't do this. You want to open up that language into some areas of, of language of choice for them so that they have the option as well. We also want to learn how to just respond non-defensively to criticism and a couple of quick ways that we can do that. One is to seek more information, to say, oh, okay, I, I hear what you're saying. Tell me more about that. Tell me, tell me why you think that. We can seek more information and go from there. 
or we can agree with the critic. We can say, yeah, I agree with you. I, I messed that up, or this is this is not a great situation. So let's work together to fix that. Okay? So those are some ways that we can create a supportive communication climate. If you have questions about anything else related to this or anything else in interpersonal communication, feel free to shoot me an email. In the meantime, go out there and start creating, intentionally creating some good communication.